just want to walk through a bit of a journey that we've taken in terms of what we're going to present to you today. It started a couple of years ago when I started at Wellington City. And um, to, to cut a long story short, our real, real, real world problem in local government is that things are getting tougher and tougher, things are more, are more expensive, less affordable, and to be honest, I expect we're not actually alone. The big driver here is without doubt um, our infrastructure, the costs are huge, and it's about what I believe to be um, heading off into a bit of a crisis zone, and I'll explain what I mean in a minute. Wellington City is in a decay at a rate of $2 million a week. We spend over $100 million a year on renewals of our infrastructure across the board. So any way that we're able to chunk that down, slow that down, carry the risk in the right place, um, is going to be significant added value, public value, um, to our community who obviously we look after assets on behalf of. Um, that's the curve we use. You can see it can be really fast or really slow, and it's about understanding that curve in broad terms. Our particular problem is uh, our three waters assets. It's not ours alone, it's everyone's problem. It's New Zealand Inc's problem. Actually, to be honest, it's everybody in the new world's problem. Most of us put infrastructure into the ground at the end of the Second World War and again in a large dollop when the baby boomers came along and had children of their own. And we've been growing reasonably steady ever since. The real and fundamental issue that we have is the materials that we put in the ground uh, back in the, uh, in the 40s, 50s and 60s and the ones we put into the ground at the, in the 70s and 80s are actually steel pipes and things like that and asbestos concrete pipes are landing in and around the same time. These ones in the second generation haven't lasted anywhere as long. So <coughs> that's a real problem and I suspect, well I don't suspect, I know that we've been living off our investments in the past and by and large, we're coming up to the first full replacement cycle of our assets underground. And everybody knows how expensive they are. So when I came to Wellington, um, to cut a long story short, um, if, you, if we're going to deal with this quite significant issue, we have to take, in my view, the next level of sophisticated analytics or sophisticated um, assessment of our assets and to do that, you need to do a number of things. And, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to bang on about data for a while, shortly. But we had low mathematical precision on our data in our asset bases. And I'm not just talking about water, I'm talking about across the board. Some of our asset systems were more mature than others. Um, to be honest, guys, the, the roading guys have done a pretty good job. NZTA have kept everybody on to a reasonable level of competency for quite some time. Our water assets. Um, were, were probably the second tier and because I think most of the other assets are, are above ground um, we haven't tended to take what I would refer to as a, um, a strategic asset planning approach we've tended to take a much more operational maintenance approach to um, managing our assets by taking the transition from what was to what now is defined as a strategic asset planning approach. The level of sophistication around what we need to enable us to do that gives us a different starting point. And all I'm suggesting here is that our starting point um, was much less sophisticated than what we needed to do, what we need to do in the future, given the, the real world problem I've just described. So data wasn't aligned, it wasn't well integrated, um, and quite simply advanced analytics is not possible. So we basically went back to the drawing board. If you come from where I come from in manufacturing, um, and my last employer before I came back to New Zealand was actually still in Australia, but the scope of it's known. I worked at Point Kembla. And what, what commercial entities, and companies like Air New Zealand, because no one likes their planes falling out of the sky, they have some significantly um, well-founded foundations which they base all of this on. And the first one is 
metadata specifications. Now, don't, eyes don't close over because this is going to be a little bit crunchy for a second, so I'll explain what that means. But what we need, in my view, and what we've adopted as an international standard of metadata for assets across our asset suites in Brighton City. Every single type of asset has a metadata schema which you need to collect information to actually understand what the asset is and how it's performing through time. So let me explain. This is a 3D drawing of five of our houses in Wellington City. You can see there it's just a, a bunch of um, uh, five buildings with a, a, a few out exterior assets. But actually what we want to know is what are the components of a house, the metadata of a house, or the schema of a house, and what bit is going to last how long and why. So if you look at corrugated iron roofs, is it different to a concrete tile roof? Is it different to a steel tile roof? Is it different to a slate roof? And the answer is yes. Each of those products last a different length of time. So we need to understand what the asset is of a roof what the, and the attributes of that so we can understand that. Even inside a house, we come into the house, we need to understand what all the components of the house so we can do the same thing. And you end up with literally thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of data, which is where these guys come in, because it's about big data. To give you another example, it's a really simple one. If you take an asbestos concrete pipe in Wellington, which is stuck in Grey Wacky somewhere around the hills here, and it's exactly this, put in the ground at exactly the same time, time as an asbestos pipe concrete is put in at Rotorua, in the very invasive sulphur soils of that environment, I can tell you quite categorically it isn't going to last anywhere near as long. In fact, not even half as long. So even soil type, and there's a whole lot of other things that we need to understand outside the asset itself, um, form part of the information that you need to collect to make sure you understand the deterioration curves you've just seen. It's a complex, big problem, but we have a solution. The second thing you need to do is you need asset management systems that can capture this data and I guess enable the kind of analytics that I'm just starting to talk about. So if you've got a metadata specific specification that's got all the attributes, what you do is you configure your asset management systems to capture them. It's really simple stuff. We use three uh, information systems, uh, asset management information systems in Wellington. Innovise is a three waters product. There are a number of others, Hanson and things like that. The, the cool thing about having a metadata standard, it's actually systems agnostic, so it's commercially um, for want of a better word, yeah, commercially agnostic even. <coughs> RAM is pretty much generally used across New Zealand, most of you will know that if you know anything about roads or, or local government or NZTA in New Zealand. That manages our roading infrastructure right across the board. That's how we get our money from local government, from central government, to cut a long story short. And we use SPM for our built and green assets, so we've got 3,500 houses in our, so, sorry, 2,500 houses in our housing, social housing stock, we've got a number of properties, around the cities you might want to imagine, including swimming pools and parks and parks and hockey fields and turf, you know, all sorts of things. So that's that's what's in there. So if I've got a metadata schema and I've configured my asset management system, all I need now is the algorithms. It's actually an iterative process. To be honest, we started with the algorithms first. We knew we knew what we needed to know in terms of the information and attributes in the algorithms to ensure that we collected the right stuff, the metadata schemes all lined up, and um, our systems were actually configured to it. So, nice, tight, scientific platform how we're going to approach this. This is where we work. It's kind of all over the place. But we've made a lot of progress to this. In the middle of that is the sweet spot for making decisions. Let me tell you, the difference is huge. So, how do we put this together? So there's a bit of a strategy in thinking around um, what we needed to do to enable all of this. Good idea, how do you fix it? So, 
Um, Rod, uh, Roger, you quite right. We started off on, on waters, but can I tell you, this is asset agnostic, and you'll see that shortly. But what we did was we recognised we've got a lot of stuff. We've got GI standards, we've got technical standards, design and build, local, regional, and national standards. I can think of um, um, any number of ASNZ standards we use in our business to help us run our, our assets in one way, shape, form, or the other. And international standards, the obvious ones in our space are um, IMM and ISO, ISO 15000 and what's PS55, which people are talking about right now. But we didn't have metadata standards. If you look at the models that we support our analytics to date, we've got condition models, we've got and are building things like resilience models and criticality models. We've got capacity models, we've got some demand, demand models. As you go up, it gets more patchy, to be fair. Financial models, we've always got those. Finance guys. Um, economic models, we're just really starting to get some sophisticated economic models in our space, to be honest. I don't think we're that, we've got a long way to go in that space. And as for the last three, I don't know too much. I don't know of how much is done in the infrastructure space that reflect those three. There is a natural hierarchy here and a natural maturity, but what the really interesting thing for me is, there is no statistical models. And I've talked to a lot of people across our sector and others, and there's not a lot of stuff done in this space, which is really fascinating. So the two fundamental building blocks for managing assets across NZ Inc. are pretty light in this space. So I think there's a fundamental shift required in our thinking about how we attack this if we're going to deal with this crazy problem that we're all dealing with. So I said there's a, a natural maturity to this. Um, the interesting thing is, it doesn't matter what the asset is. So transport assets, do you know the statistical model for our assets and attributes in the water space is exactly the same as a statistical model in our transportation assets. Why wouldn't it be? Do you have enough data of the right type to stand up here, for example, or to my counsel as the case may be, hand on heart and go, actually all of these models I've just built are statistically competent or mathematically precise enough to, um, to stand up here and be able to meet and open my mouth at all? So it's kind of fascinating. Um, it's the same as built assets and it's the same as green assets. The same principles apply. They've got their own metadata schemas, they've got their own algorithms, but the fundamentals are exactly the same. So that is the platform of how we've built our asset information across our assets in Wellington City to set the foundations. So it sounds good in theory. So what do we find? This is when it gets kind of scary. <laughs> so, First thing we did was we actually went and did an analysis on what we had in our systems. Actually, we bought a new system and we're implementing another one right now. So we got all the data from all over the place, we populated it, and we built some statistical models to understand what we did and what we didn't know. And I think that's probably a key point, is that we actually knew for the first time what we didn't know, to be honest. So that's the first, that's the first time that I met um, Phil and Kim and the guys. I needed to get a handle on what attributes I needed to collect to make everything else that we did sense. Um, so we put all of that together in a program of work. So you can see, you can actually read that thing, I don't know. 2012 to 2015. So three years, oh, two years ago, my crew and myself, with the support from um, from the chiefs and, and, and so on and so forth, put together a program of works from the, from the statistical models, a whole raft of streams of data collection projects that have that started 18 months ago and continue today and will continue for the next two years. We resourced, we resourced it through our normal processes, our um, annual plans and long-term plans. And we developed, I think you'll like this, uh, the Treasury's Better Business Case framework. 
um, put it all together, did a proof of concept um, with harmonics, and took it to our executive and said, this is where we think we need to go to manage our assets if this is the problem we have in front of us. Tick. So off we went. So, this is where you come. So what I want to show you is the first models that have come out from those statistical models, the first deterministic models and, um, and physical models that tell us about, starting to tell us about some of our assets. So if you just go to the first one, Joe. So this is Karori. This is Karori's wastewater network. In, in the top left hand corner you can see condition 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So on that deterioration curve, 1 is good, lasts a long time, 5 is bad. So you're just about the end of your natural life. We're able to, in the in, in that analytics, through an understanding of when we put things in the ground, some understanding from the condition, the actual condition that we have on pipes, push this information from our asset management information system to harmonics to do a statistical model, uh, sorry, yeah, a statistical model that represents when we expect failure of a pipe at what we call an asset ID level, which is between two manholes, um, through time, and how much, because I know how much the pipes are worth today, in today's dollars, we're up for in the future supply. So as that ticks along, the asset actually gets older, the assets get older, they come up for replacement, they get replaced with like with like at this stage. And we can see what pipes we need being replaced when and the value. So the top one is a histogram for our annual plan and our LTP. The bottom one is our annuals curve. Just so you know, that's for 100 years. We go to the next one. So. Well, that's all very well being like for like. What about, you know, we've got clay pipes into, into PVC pipes. We've got um, old asbestos concrete pipes. We don't want to make them asbestos pipes anymore. We want to make them HDDB or HDB or something, or maybe steel or whatever. <coughs> and, oh, by the way, what size pipe do we need to make? Well, actually, if I know what the growth is going to be, or forecast growth in the city, um, and I know what current materials we would replace them with, Therefore, I can calculate quite quickly what pipes I'm going to renew for growth reasons. So it's quite again. So it's at set at one percent a year. We're actually about 0.8 in Wellington. So you can see there's actually quite a lot of capacity. We don't have to do too much for growth for about 30 years. That begs a lot of questions. So is that right? So, actually what we need is both. So if you want to play both, so we put the algorithms together and never run it. So basically all it's doing is it's calculating what, um, what pipes we need to replace it with what size and what material out for as far as we care to actually. So, We've not just done Miramar, uh, sorry, uh, Karori, we've also done Miramar, just to give you that we've done renewal and growth for Miramar. And um, we can put them side by side. And anybody who wants to spend three seconds thinking about that, well, if you can do that, there's some potential thinking around where we should be going in terms of where our capacities are and aren't, in terms of the growth of our city. You can chuck that down. And, um, yeah, do the last one. Just to show off, we've actually done all the way to see. So you can see that we've got a clear line of sight on renewal versus growth. And for those in the room who know what depreciation funding <coughs> means, growth, i.e. loans versus DCs, it comes, it becomes really simple really quickly. So you can see over 100 years we've got that kind of curve. There's a couple of, you can almost see that we're putting it in the ground in big lumps. That's the interesting thing about it. And actually if you, if you get time, you can actually see where parts of the suburb are obviously built. 
grow old and the way you get the place is quite, quite fascinating. So go to the next one, Jonah. Uh, we've actually done it for the, the resurfacing for the roads in our city. So AC, um, chip seal, different types of chip seal, AC, concrete, whatever. And we can run the same curve. If you get this stuff right at the first, in the first instance, can it how long does it take him to go from the water one to the to the roadie one? A week or two, yeah. max. So it's it's not this is not rocket science, guys. This is actually pretty simple stuff. They're doing the smart stuff. Just the last one. Oh, you yeah, we did the whole Wellington too, just so you can have a look at. I will let this one run because it's really fascinating. In one regard. So what what I'm what I'm suggesting is we don't need to. We don't um, have uh, any kind of issue with what type of asset it is. I'm just in the middle of um, building the, the, the blocks to do all of our properties, our housing stock, and our, our buildings, our swimming pools and everything uh, along the same lines. Now any of you guys will know in the roading space, um, Rob, 15, 20 years, is a cycle for a roads about? You can see it in here. The full cycle of replacement on a road, because so, that's 100 years. Um, it's, um, yeah, plenty of those up there. So we spend, and I checked this morning, because I actually didn't, we spend between 5.2 and 7.7 .7 million dollars a year on resales and local city and they've done for the last few years. Looks about right. To me. So, um, you go back to it. Cheers. So what's the benefit of all of this? What, what we need in council is not just engineering, not just finance, and not just um, spatial planning capability. We need them all. And the information that we're talking about is, is literally plugged into right across the organisation for completely different reasons. I guess the sell here is, is that if you get the metadata right and you understand the frameworks of your, your data and your analytics, to put census data in on top of, to put whatever on top of, is actually really simple. Um, just to frighten a couple of people from loading, it's very easy for us to run the TSA outside RAM for the first time. And like, we can do sensitivity and scenario analysis on it easily. I just talked to the RAM guys today and they were pretty excited about that. So it's about balanced, informed, evidence-based decision making. So in practice, what does it mean though? From an asset point of view, you can imagine if it's at an asset ID level, you can actually go and check the stuff in the front and actually do the condition assessments and make sure you understand whether you need to actually replace this stuff or not. Or if you are, is it a little bit later than you imagine? You can easily do all your forward works interrogation programs and things like condition assessments, um, <coughs> material sampling, CCD, whatever it is in the pipe space. Um, you can also, I haven't done it yet, but it's, it's not that big a deal. Um, we can understand quite quickly across the three waters networks the road that we're going to seal the year before the pipe gets put in the ground. So you can e get some absolute transparency on this. And because it's such an easy tool, you can rerun this. It, it takes as long as to run, about that long to run it when we do the analytic. So it's really quick. So that's the other cool tool, thing about the tool. You can make decisions about how you're going to manage your assets. You can run stuff to fail and not run stuff to fail. So for example, if we want to carry a little bit of risk, and I suspect this is one of the discussions this year, <laughs> Justin is, um, is um, if, we want, if we want to run to fail, let's just say all of the pipes have got less than 100 connections in the city, what does that mean for our commitments? And also, what do I do to, to make sure that, that that group of the population is safe? got transparency on that for people in the council to make the decision, as opposed to the water pipe that goes up to the hospital, which you wouldn't do that. So because you've got that kind of clarity or visibility on your networks down to that level of granularity, you can make some pretty savvy informed decisions. The other thing is that you can actually measure 
asset performance at an asset ID level? Are we getting the value proposition out of our assets we're supposed to be? We can actually go back and interrogate, I haven't done it yet, because some of this is quite new, to see what our roading program performance was like from 1999 through to today. And I will be doing just that, because I can run the analytic that you just saw with the 1999 data, because I've got it, to see what 2014 looked like and do a little analysis around, you know, what's the value of that thing that we've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years. Financial, it's pretty obvious now. Forward works programs, transparency, 30 plus years. 30 years is nothing. You can do it as long as you like. Um, you can do split your funding schemas very easily. In fact, I think I've got a yeah, table here. Um, like, does this work now? Um, you can actually see those are actual jobs <coughs> based on um, asset type right through to when they were installed, um, when their end of life is calculated to be, the, the pipe size, the cost, and then the renewal cost and the growth cost, the depreciation, or the, um, the uh, DC cost based on growth or improvement as the case may be. So I'll do that Really important for our guys in, the, in, the, in what we call the treasury, but our, what our borrowing implications are out 10, 15, 20 years. We can actually see the full life cycle of our, of our loan funding periods for the first time. If I've got a, we've got a $100 million problem in year 18 or 17 or 16, what's the implications in year 22 or 23? I think this is what the 30 year strategy is all about. Because we do have such problems. We do have interceptors that are getting old. We do have $100 million bridges. And not in the gorge just here, that aren't in the schemas yet because we haven't looked that far out. We know it's there, but it's not moving out. I'm not saying we don't plan for it, but actually we haven't done the analysis on the on the financials well enough yet. Again, I talked about carrying risk in that space, and then the 30-year infrastructure order requirements are pretty simple. Don't have risk. <laughs> uh, spatial planning. There's some really um, Im important economic development opportunities here. What's the opportunity cost and benefit of growing the town in this suburb versus this suburb if I understand what the headroom in my, in my um, infrastructure capacity on the pipes? If we've got a greenfield site, we're looking at uh, some northern grey stuff at a place called um, Wingershire Farms, I think it's called. I did a quick, just literally back of the envelope calculations, about $200 million to do that infrastructure wise. Use some of the um, use some of the the normalised costs that we have here in the city and currently. Now it's not my decision about whether we're going to spend two hundred million dollars to go to the Lincolnshire Farms, but I'd like my council to know that it is going to cost that, and there's an opportunity cost of benefit to put those same people in the capacity we've already got in the networks with the rest of it. So it becomes a really helpful tool in, in, in so many different ways, and here's an example from the spatial planning way. We can do capacity metrics around the city, density metrics around the city, can actually calculate the average walk distance from a house to a park, from every house and every park in the city to get some sort of social metric about how, how cool our city is in relation to um, the services we provide. It's really simple once you've got that, you know, that capability. So the vision. This is something that, I, I, from now, it's kind of like sort of getting out of Wellington City. It's gambit, I suppose, but it's something that I'd like to share with you because it does affect us in a way. If we've got a really solid platform and everybody's adopted metadata standards and we set our systems up the same way, why should party rule be any different than us? Well, it shouldn't be. In actual fact, why should it be any different for any of us? Out as it should. It's really simple. But here's the really, really cool thing: is if the sector gets itself sorted out, and we, um, and we're talking about roads again, just for a second. Why should our roads be any different than the NZTAs and the analytics and the TSAs that we're all using anyway? Be the same. The answer is it shouldn't be. It's pretty simple. Um, and we're talking to NZTA about that right now. Um, in terms of housing, I said we've got three and a, two and a half thousand social housing units in our housing stock. 
why should it be any different for these guys who've got 70,000 houses? The answer is, it shouldn't. And we're also talking and looking at a proof of concept project with Housing Corp to do exactly the same thing. If that's the case, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out the rest. Why is it any different than a classroom in the education department? Why should we be a corrugated iron roof in our local hall, on our social housing house, in a housing corp house, on a classroom somewhere in the country be any different? The answer is it shouldn't be. So, the practical vision here of the fancy one I just explained. It's really simple, but it's really simple. It's just about going back to first principles. I talked about statistical models and I talked about metadata standards. We have a little phrase, don't we, um, Justin and, and the council? Do the basics well. So that's all I'm asking, is that we think about doing the basics well. And the difference in our capability in Wellington City by doing that is just phenomenal. Um, if we move our renewals curve, by just 1% in Wellington City, that's a, between 10 and $20 million a year in operator co operations cost savings. So it's significant. I mean, if you can do that across the country, the, 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 number, the number is probably mind-blowing. So where are we now, two years later? Well, I can at least think of one person in the room who did a golf with it in this. Um, <coughs> so we're slightly less than two years. Some of our asset classes, I'm not going to say all because we've got different, uh, different maturity um, through, the, um, through our asset suites. Um, our water's assets are much more um, advanced now than they would have been very close to, uh, in certain circumstances, to where our roading assets are. 68% data consistency in our, in our, better, one, our better sets are up to 73%. Um, our data is getting much more aligned. Our data is now integrated. You can see that by being able to run models. Um, advanced analytics is simply possible and actually proven. That's what we've just seen. And we've gone from off to the end of the fire. So that's, um, that's me. I'll pass it over.